Get started. So, glad to be here. Good to see everybody here. It's good to see lots of faces from St. Con and other conferences we've seen this year. I, I typically start off my meetings at work with some type of joke, so here you go. What did one DNA sequence say to the other DNA sequence? Do these genes make me look fat? So if you got nothing else from today, at least you can take something home to get a smile out of it. So who am I? My name's Brandon Benson. I've been a CISP for a really long time. I currently run a SOC for one of the Silicon Slope um, companies. I've been in cybersecurity longer than I care to admit. So um, I definitely am a curious learner. I think this is a great field to be in if we want to continue to do, to do that. So what have I done over the last 15 plus years? I've worked with lots of companies to secure sensitive data, either encrypting it or auditing it or working with them to make sure their information is secure. I've investigated breaches from both internal and external sources. I've broken a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, and I've fixed a few things too. So why this presentation? So a lot of our jobs still in the cybersecurity space, um, it's the cyber footprint for all of our employers. I think in a good many cases, as, I work with, as I've worked with different companies in the world, I've noticed that we do a really good job of implementing and coveraging, covering risks and mitigating risks for our internal networks. We do a fairly good job in most cases of segmenting if you've got to do any type of compliance. You do a pretty good job of making sure that patches are somewhat in place. Uh, you've got a risk management program. You've got some of the basics covered. Uh, you get uh, role-based access controls in place. You have your active directories and stuff like that. Unfortunately, uh, attacks continue to evolve. Uh, and we've seen that, I think, over the last year. And attackers continue to evolve with those attacks to develop new techniques or maybe old techniques. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so I don't think it'll ever end for blue teamers, and I don't think it'll ever end for defenders. So this year, probably last year, uh, last December, I think was the biggest one we've seen, where you start seeing supply chain attacks in the cyberspace, not just in the physical space. Um, for me, a lot of supply chain seemed theoretical until I saw it kind of hit home. So supply chain attacks, when I thought about it, if you'd asked me three years ago, I'd say, yeah, I've done audits on systems or in companies where they take sensitive hardware and I go through it with the company and I walk through from when the company receives the hardware into the warehouse, how they send it to a secure cage to flash it with the encryption keys and stuff like that, how they track it from the secure cage out to the loading dock, track it from the loading dock to the end user at which point it's implemented. And that could be an HSM, it could be a POS device, and I would watch all of that and try and determine where people could break in and add code or add their own firmware or uh, hijack a truck to steal it so they could replace it with other things. Other types of supply chains um, I've looked at would be things like, okay, I'm going to hijack a, a semi-truck. I'm going to put in a bunch of like fake Gucci purses so they get the retail stores and get sold for a, real, a whole lot of money, um, things like that. But I don't think supply chains in the cyberspace is new. A few years ago, like in the early 2000s, Western Digital, which is a hard drive manufacturer, ended up with a problem with a whole batch of their hard drives that came out of Asia. What happened was somebody actually took the hard drive and before, as a hard drive was flashed in the bootloader section, so the part that doesn't get um, re-imaged when you re-image a drive, they put in a piece of malware that would end up stealing data. Um, Western Digital found out about that. That ha ended up happening in their factory, and they had to recall a whole batch of hard drives and then fix the issue. Other things I've seen uh, kind of in my career is POS, uh, POS devices swap. So credit card fraud's been a big deal for a really long time. Uh, and so we see stores that you'll walk into a store or a 7-Eleven and you'll see people put cameras on POS devices or you'll see them swap out POS devices with compromised devices that look the same or you'll see them put little skimmers inside the devices so they can steal your credit card data. Uh, 
And so that type of supply chain attack has not been anything new. The PCI Council came out and put guidance around merchants to say, check your devices. If they seem like they've been tampered with, you should probably get them replaced. Um, so shipping industry, mercantile, none of that should be new as far as supply chain. Um, one of the intriguing ones was a few years ago at DEF CON, a security conference, somebody actually placed malware inside the CD in one of the programs. So when people got home and opened the CD, they actually ended up infecting their computers with malware. However, there's a few that are probably worth talking about that we've seen emerge over recently. And we'll go through a, two or three key studies to see um, if we can learn something or see if we can implement controls or recommendations to make our environments a little bit more secure. Uh, before we start, though, like it's beneficial to understand a typical attacker methodology. So most attacks follow four general steps. There's typically some type of reconnaissance. Well, let's see if this video will play. So um, it's some type of thieving of data, and it's usually some type of crazy thieving of data. So this is an office uh, I work for um, on occasion to sideline. That person who just walked out had walked into the office. Um, it's a therapy office, so the therapist was there. They left their office for a minute. That person walked in. What they had under their um, coat or th their sweater, if you'll notice, is a little bricky looking, right? Because they just took uh, the therapist's laptop and her purse and her little booklet and stuff like that. Uh, I got called in as soon as we found it. We s identified it on the camera. Um, and then we went ahead and contacted law enforcement. So this is here in Utah. Uh, then we were able to track, they lost their phone as well. So then we were able to use some of the tools on the phone and the laptop to find out where this particular individual was. Uh, met the police officers down at a local mall as they were trying to spend as much money as they could on the person's credit card and ended up actually getting that person arrested. So um, that's the type of supply chain attack we talk about. Um, it was fun. It's a little exciting to be able to be part of that. But in many cases, what attackers do um, in the cyber world is they'll do Reconnaissance is just like anybody else. You see strange people driving in your neighborhood. You see attackers probing your system, trying to identify what software or what applications you're running. They'll look at your website to see what vendors or suppliers you use. Uh, once they figure that out, then they'll try and figure out how to execute or get access to your system in some way. Uh, once attackers gain access, they'll deliver a payload to try and distill as much data as they can as, in as little time as possible without being caught, of course. Um, they'll use vulnerabilities, they'll use social engineering, they'll use suppliers, they'll use vendors, they'll use a whole bunch of things, and then they'll go ahead and steal that data and exploit it, and then elevate privileges, install persistence, uh, and then they'll take whatever they can. Typically, as a last resort, if there's nothing interesting on uh, that system, it's not uncommon to see people place crypto miners. Um, it's also not uncommon uh, and this is why we kind of talk and harp to like our friends and relatives don't download unlicensed software and stuff like that. It's not, it's not uncommon to see malware placed in those programs as well that either place crypto miners or credential stealing um, programs or anything like that in place. Let's talk about a few uh, different types of attack vectors I think are worth mentioning. Um, third-party software vulnerabilities. So a year ago, a huge one came out, um, and I vowed not to use it because it's been talked about a lot, so I used a different one. So uh, in the last 12 months, there was a ticketing system uh, that's used um, both on internal ticketing systems for companies as well as for companies to use for customers, their customers, to issue tickets when there's a problem. That ticketing system came out with a, vulner a critical vulnerability that allowed an attacker to bypass a system authentication through a remote code execution vulnerability. So the ticketing systems, many of those were actually publicly exposed. Uh, and within a few days, and this is one of the points that I'll bring up, within a few days of that, uh, that vulnerability being released, attackers had developed a proof of concept code so they could actually take an attack and exploit that vulnerability much or very much within or very much before the 30 days that you typically see compliance um, groups actually say you need to patch. Uh, 
right? So I was driving to work one morning. I heard about this in one of our news feeds I subscribed to. Um, and then based on that, as I got into work, I worked with my team and said, we need to go find every system that is this product that is um, vulnerable. And then we need to make sure that one, we haven't been attacked, and two, we make sure it's patched or mitigated in some way, right? Um, in our case, we had saw several different probes as we looked at it, it was, if we looked at the timeline of when the exploit was made publicly available, it was probably within two hours that we saw probes against our systems or our environments. And then from there, we ended up um, tearing down a couple of those servers, rebuilding them. And then for the others that had not been accessed, we were able to get mitigations in place to prevent the attack. Um, and so I think. It's very much the third-party software vulnerabilities are all over the place. Earlier this year, Apache came out with a remote code execution vulnerability as well. Um, last December, there was a huge one that came out. Um, so that's definitely something as far as that goes. But how do, we, how do we prevent this? Well, many times we can't. We rely on these third-party software vulnerabilities, or these third-party softwares. We need them to be able to get our systems and our environments and our applications to run. Uh, but there are some recommendations that we can implement that will actually make us do a little bit better. Uh, one is know your publicly exposed services. I don't know how many companies I've worked with or audited where I'm like, did you know this is public? They're like, no. I'm like, did you know this other application was public? They're like, it's not public. I'm like, well, here it is from the internet. Um, so understand your publicly exposed services understand the software that is behind those publicly exposed services, and then limit, um, lock those down as far as configurations go, and limit those exposed services to only what's necessary. If you can put them in behind some type of authentication, great. If you can't, then make sure you're up to date. Subscribe to the news feeds of those vendors so that as critical patches or as critical vulnerabilities are released, you can go through and make sure you're aware of those and then work with the teams to make sure those are patched. Um, mitigate and patch as soon as possible. Sometimes you can't patch uh, because there's no patch for it, but you can mitigate. You can block ports, uh, you can block services, you can restrict to certain IP ranges and stuff like that. 30, 30 days these days is way too long. I know PCI and SOC2 and some of these others say, yeah, patch your critical vulnerabilities within 30 days. Uh, if you wait 30 days and there's a proof of concept code that's out in the wild, you're too late. So uh, we've seen that anywhere from three hours to two days, uh, attacks start happening on the internet so that we see people trying to probe and find vulnerabilities so that they can exploit them. Um, yeah, case one. Case two, third-party access, vendors. It's not uncommon for companies to hire out for vendors to take a look at their support their systems to provide support or other types of access. Um, and it's not uncommon for vendor contractors to have system access or support there to support other activities. Um, way back in 2014, if anyone followed the target breach, that's kind of what happened, right? Um, the HVAC vendor had access to the target systems and a hacker compromised through a phishing, I believe it was phishing, the HVAC vendor. From there, they're able to grab the credentials of, that the vendor used to log into Target, and then from there, they compromised all of Target systems, which was an awesome hack for a bunch of credit cards to be stolen. Um, we continued to see this, right? Uh, I investigated one recently. Well, there's two, actually, for vendors. So I'll talk about both cases. Um, Outside of the target one, the other one I've seen is um, there are times that vendors will use third-party companies to provide certain types of support for their environments as well. It could be a call center. It could be an e-commerce or an e-support desk or anything like that. Um, so the first one I talked about is if you have a vendor contractor and they get compromised, then those credentials, credentials can be used to then compromise your systems. And I've investigated probably five or six in the last 10 years, or that's actually been the case. The other one that I've seen um, that's kind of interesting as well, and we start to see it here and there on the news, but not a lot, but it's a real threat, is when vendors are become insider threats, right? That's where you see a vendor that's been hired to do certain services for you. It could be call center, e, um, 
system support, uh, monitoring, troubleshooting, and you give them unfettered access to those systems, that vendor gets bribed or otherwise um, contacted by an adversary saying, hey, if you will, I'll pay you XYZ number of dollars if you'll give me some credentials or if you'll start to pull some data out for me. And depending on where those third-party vendors are, that could be really tempting. I did an investigation a couple years ago where that happened, where I was working. Um, there was a company that was providing support for a cell phone provider, and one of the two or three of the employees of that, that company had been bribed externally, and they were able to take and uh, kind of make cell phones disappear off the system, so they became ghost phones, and they were paid, every time they provided that to the attacker, they were paid like two or 3,000 bucks. It was a third world country, that's pretty good money, right, for them. And so make sure you keep track of your vendors and also monitor their activity as, as far as that goes. Um, other things that we've seen, uh, as I talk and, and work with vendors to make sure that they've got good security practices, uh, one of the questions I've started to ask is, do you use the same access keys and credentials um, to access our system as you do for other customers? And if the answer to that question is yes, which 60% of the time so far it's been about uh, yes, then we require them as part of our contract to use unique credentials to access our system. So they're not using the same credentials to access a whole bunch of their other customers. Um, other things, if you can get away with it, is each of those vendor workers should be able to access your system with unique credentials. So you can attribute what they're doing to an actual person instead of the vendor itself. It's not uncommon for vendors when they access your system to use some type, especially if it's a support desk uh, scenario, to use shared credentials. So you may have six or seven people at the vendor company that will actually use the same credential to access your system. The problem with that becomes when there's an event or an incident, and now, now you have to go and try and attribute and figure out who did the malicious activity. And you go back to the vendor and say, we need to understand who did the malicious activity, and they can't tell you. The reason why is because they're using share credentials among themselves. So recommendations there, um, and I need to add one here, but implement good credential management for your vendors. Make sure, if at all possible, each of the vendor people who are gonna contact or connect to your system actually have their own unique credentials to log in. Uh, implement key management requirements for vendors, uh, and I'll give you another story in just a second. Uh, implement MFA for SSH access, don't use passwords. Um, and implement key rotation requirements, and that's where the other story comes in. We're doing uh, some research on one where we were investigating an issue, uh, and we come to find out that there was an employee of a vendor who had left like a year and a half earlier, but they hadn't gone through and done good kind of offboarding of their employee, and that employee ended up having access to a system of one of the other companies I worked with. And so as we were consulting, we walked in to do this response. We tracked it down to this actual person and the employee, we reached out to the vendor and said, okay, this is the employee and this is the SSH key that was used to access the system. And then they turned around and said, yeah, but that person hasn't been with us for a year. And I said, well, why wasn't it cleaned up? Now we have a new process to make sure that we do audit of all of vendor accounts to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. Uh, and don't allow vendors, if at all possible, to use the same key for multiple customers. I think I talked about that. The other thing is if there's a sensitive system or a sensitive process and you need just periodic help support, um, tag one of your internal people to be on the line or set up whatever um, web sharing session is there and don't leave them alone. Monitor them while they're in your system and then revoke access as soon as they're out. Uh, that's, um, it's a little more resource intensive as far as you as a company, but it does save you from some of these other things happening. Third scenario, um, popular software library. It was talked about or mentioned just briefly earlier. Um, a lot of our developers are using Git. They'll use software libraries that are open source or third party. Uh, a lot of those open source or third party softwares um, sometimes are maintained well. Sometimes there's a lot of contributors. And this particular uh, case that happened earlier this year, it was the uh, Node.js library. Uh, hackers identified that Node.js um, had millions of downloads a week. Uh, 
the attacker actually was able to um, hijack the account that was used to deploy the malicious and deploy the malicious version of the library uh, for Node.js. Since there's millions of downloads a week, that's pretty good for an attacker to have a nice single point of entry. As that was deployed, the libraries were installed, and it wasn't just crypto mining software, so I'm going to use your resources on your system to mine cryptocurrency, but there's also password stealing Trojans that were attempted to be installed in systems as well. So I'm going to take your credentials and I'm going to mine cryptocurrency and you get to pay the power bill and I'm super happy to have your creds, right? There are a lot of companies that this was reported. There were actually three different versions of the Node.js that actually ended up being deployed uh, for three different versions of the libraries that were there. Uh, this goes back into other recommendations as well. You have to be able to monitor for critical vulnerabilities um, and disclosures to even software or libraries of software that you're using to secure your environment. Um, implement good monitoring systems in your systems to look for unknown or common indicators of compromise. Uh, this particular um, issue was caught because some of the EDR software and some of the other software noticed that there were strange connections out to command and control servers that were known to be malicious. Uh, that was identified and then reported back up to the author of the library. And from the author of the library, they published an article that was then picked up by the industry so that everybody could look for that. Uh, mitigate and patch as soon as possible, of course. And then if you find vulnerable versions of software in your environment, make sure that you don't have repositories of those so that in six weeks or a year, when kind of the dust is settled, you don't accidentally deploy those again. Um, yeah. So takeaways, takeaways. Uh, cybersecurity is, is, will always keep us pretty, pretty active, right? So every investigation that I've done over the last 15 years, uh, I've learned new attack techniques. Um, I've used it to kind of improve what I know and how I use it, and I think that's kind of what we can do here, is take the information we have, be able to apply it to a broader spectrum, and then from that, be able to better secure the environments or the servers of the companies we work with. So, stop there for any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your time.